today we're going to talk about someone needing to grow in their walk with Christ and how that happens. Now, if you go back to the Great Commission found in Matthew chapter 28, he gives us what we're to do and how we're to do that. And, and you know this passage, but let me read it to you again. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember I'm with you always to the end of the age." Those who are being baptized, they have met with Jesus, they're connecting with the church, but now it says we want them to grow, and they do so as you teach them to observe what Christ has commanded. Now, just out of curiosity, what exactly has Christ commanded? Where can we find the commands of Jesus Christ? How do we know what Jesus has told us? Anybody have any idea? From his word. He has spoken very clearly. And we're going to talk about studying God's word today. But I want you to notice 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13 and a few verses after that. Evil people and impostors will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, the Bible, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. What this says is that God's Word is His plan for someone growing and maturing and developing in their Christian life. You cannot grow spiritually apart from God's Word, and God's Word is all you need in order to grow spiritually. And so we're going to talk about that today. A church that wants to mature and to encourage Christians to grow and to mature and develop will do so through a systematic, through a planned and strategic way of teaching the Bible. And we have an example of that found in the book of Nehemiah. If you've made it to Nehemiah chapter 8, will you please say amen? amen. And we are going to begin there in... Verse 7. Verse 7. Now, chapter 8, verse 1 through 6, it describes a corporate worship service. It says that all of Israel gathered together, that Ezra got up and he began reading out of the book, proclaiming out of the book, and they were worshiping together. But then we have a change of scenery beginning in verse 7. So let me read verse 7. It says this, Jeshua, Bonnie, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah. That sounds like some Cajun folks right there, guys. Who were Levites. They explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. The first thing I want you to note was this. The group's size produced growth. The group size produced growth. Uh, you had here a group of men who were given a responsibility to teach. And uh, notice he gives these names of all of these guys. And, and then it says that they were all Levites. Well, who were the, the Levites? The, the Levites were a tribe within Israel. And this tribe was given the responsibility of serving as the spiritual leaders. Uh, you had within this tribe one of the clans, one of the families. Uh, from that family came the priests that would offer the sacrifices in the temple and in the tabernacle. But you had other members of this tribe that were not part of the priestly clan, but they were considered Levites, and their job was to take care of the temple and, and clean it and fix it up and all of that. But it was also to know the law of God and to communicate that to the rest of the people of Israel. 
you have here a group of men, a group of people who were called and equipped to teach God's Word. If you want people to learn God's Word, somebody has got to teach it. And it is a specific group of people whom God has called and equipped to do so. James chapter 3 and verse 1, I'm reminded of this passage as someone who is called and equipped to teach God's Word. It says there, not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. You say, well, how would you receive a stricter judgment? Did you know as a teacher of God's Word that I am responsible for how I live my life in accordance with God's Word? but that I also have responsibility on how you live your life based on what I teach. Now that's kind of scary, isn't it? Now I wasn't going to talk, this isn't in my notes, right? But one of the reasons, and I've got many reasons why I teach and preach that, that believers should not drink alcohol. And... and that's not the sermon today, but let me give you one of the multiple reasons, and that is this. If I, as a pastor, crack the door open on drinking alcohol, and you say, oh, well, the preacher said it was okay, and you go out, and you get drunk, and you get in a wreck, and you kill somebody, that comes back on me. And I'm not willing to have that come back on me, so you ain't never going to hear me say it's okay for a Christian to drink alcohol. One of these days I'm going to preach on it, and I'm not going to tell y'all when that is because some of y'all are going to try to stay home that day, but it ain't happening, all right? But those of us who teach, we wouldn't do so unless we were called to do so because it is a higher level of accountability that we accept when we say yes to teaching God's Word. you got to have people that are called, and praise God that He's called many of you to teach his word, but you better take that seriously because there will be a strict judgment on those of us who teach. And so they're called out, but notice what they did. Look back in the text in verse 7. It says that these Levites, these, these people who are called to teach God's word, here's what they did. They explained the law to the people. That They explained it. The, the word there means they caused them to understand. Uh, they began to, to teach in such a way, uh, not that they just got up there and they filled 30 minutes of them talking, but they taught in such a way that the message of God's Word was massaged into the hearts of those who were listening to it, those who were receiving it. But then the thing I really want to emphasize is the last part of that verse where it says, to the people as they stood in their places. Now notice that when the preacher was preaching, everybody else stood up. They must not have been Baptist. Hard to fall asleep when you're standing up, isn't it? But it said they were standing in their places. What this is describing is this was no longer a corporate setting of a large group like this. There was no big pulpit for this. There was no big stage set up for this like there was for Ezra as he was reading it. Uh, it wasn't any of that. Instead, it was the teachers going to the people in small groups, and they were teaching God's Word in small groups. Now, why would they do it in small groups? Well, a couple of things. Right now... In this large group setting, there is a time and a place for this. Ezra was doing what I'm doing right now, uh, this preaching God's word. There's a time and a place for this, and it's necessary, and it's part of what God has for the church. However, if you have a question about one of the specifics that I'm talking about today, this is not a good setting to ask that question. It just doesn't work that way. If you want to offer a comment on something that I have said, this is not a good setting for that. You, you can't do that. This is not a dialogue situation. But many of the times when we learn, it is through dialogue. It is through asking questions. You know what else I can't do in this setting? I cannot massage in a particular issue in someone's life. I can't, I can't I'm not going to call you out, but I can't point out someone and say, hey, so-and-so is dealing with this issue. How does this text and this teaching apply to so-and-so's life? We can't do that in this setting, but that is something that should be done. And the only way that that can be done is if we are in what? Smaller groups. 
And in a smaller group, you can have discussion. Someone could say, hold on there, teacher. I have a question about that. And you can deal with that issue in a smaller group. Someone is dealing with a particular issue in their life, and you can help them deal with that issue using God's Word in a small group. Uh, This makes sense to us, right? Uh, If you're looking for a school for your children, uh, you look at a number of the variables, but one of the things that you're going to look at is, what is the student-to-teacher ratio? We know this, don't we? And we prefer the student-to-teacher ratio to be larger to be smaller. Because if it's smaller, then that teacher is able to give more time to each individual student and can address their education needs in a more personal way and that communicates to a higher level and a better education. Because ultimately, we as parents who have children do not care how great and how much content the teacher teaches. What we care about is how much content our child receives and remembers and learns and so the best way to learn is in a small group and I would argue a smaller group now if we only had a strategic and systematic plan in which we had our church divide up into smaller groups and they had teachers who were trained and called and equipped to teach God's Word in this way, wouldn't that be an awesome thing for our church to have? That would be a biblical thing for our church to have, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great if we had some type of organization? It might be good if it was kind of age-graded. So, you know, you had younger folks would be together, all going through the same life stage. And, you know, parents of, of children going through the same life stage. And maybe parents of teenagers going through the same life stage. And I've learned in the parents of teenagers class, one of the main topics is how not to kill your children, right? That's one. Maybe if we had a strategic plan to do that, that'd be smart. What do y'all think? Maybe we should start something like that. Does that sound like a plan? Oh, wait a minute. We do have something like that. It is called Sunday school. We don't do Sunday school just because they used to do it that way. We do it because that's how the Bible taught people God's word. Now, let me, let me I'm going to meddle with some of y'all a little bit on this. We talking to some church folks today. Sunday school class is intended to be a small group. There are some Sunday school classes in our church that are larger than many churches are. And there is a mentality, and I'm I'm talking to teachers here just for a moment and leaders of those groups. There is a mentality that says the more we have in our group, The better teacher I am, the better leader I am, the better person I am. All right? If we want to teach better, then our classes cannot get bigger. Our classes actually have to get smaller. Now, teacher, if your goal is to pat yourself on the back, then yeah, yeah, get it bigger, whatever. But if your goal is to communicate God's word and to teach people God's word, then you don't need to grow our church and grow these people by getting your class bigger. You need to grow it by starting new classes. (gasps) You're going to split our class? I can't believe that preacher would do that. Okay, listen, let me do something right quick. There are some cuss words in the Baptist church. Did y'all know that? I know the choir knows that, but, but the rest of y'all, do y'all know that? So one, one of, the, one of the, the cuss words in a Southern Baptist church is tables in a Sunday school class. You say, I didn't know that was a cuss word. Yes, because you take a room that is for 20 people and you turn it in a room for five because that's all can get around the table. So we ain't got no, we don't have tables in a Sunday school class, if y'all didn't know that. That's why it's a cuss word. We don't like cussing here. Another cuss word is a class split. 
We don't use the word split. Don't use that word. We don't split classes. We birth new classes. When you birth a new class, that means you have a new teacher. Somebody else is using their calling and their spiritual gift. Teacher, if you just keep everybody together, you got teachers in there that aren't growing spiritually. And in fact, by not birthing a new class, you are actually holding people back from their spiritual growth. And if you hold somebody back from their spiritual growth and God wants them to grow, what does that mean you are doing? Y'all ain't willing to say it, are you? If you are holding someone back from growing spiritually, you are sinning against God. Darn, it got kind of fool in here, didn't it? The point I'm trying to make is this. If we want to grow larger, we have to do so by growing smaller. And if we're going to grow larger and people are going to develop and they're going to grow and mature in their spiritual life, then we have got to start more and more and more and more classes. And one of the results of starting more and more and more classes is we're going to have to have more and more and more rooms, which means we're going to have to have more and more buildings, which means you're going to have to have more and more money, which means y'all know what that means, all right? If we're going to reach Acadiana for Christ, how we're going to do it. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. When they wanted to teach people God's word, they did so in small groups. Let me show you the second thing. Look in verse 8. Verse 8, it says, this is what they did. This is how they explained the law to the people. It says, they read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Uh, let, let's break that down. Here's what they did. First, it says they read out of the book of the law of God. Now, now, what's the book of the law of God? Well, this would have been the Bible. This would have been the Torah, the law of God, the first five books, the Pentateuch. But it's referring to the Bible. Someone's wanting to teach the Bible. They need to start where? With the Bible. So they started with God's word. This was their starting place. They did not start with Fox News. They did not start with ESPN. They did not start with what some preacher said. They started with God's Word. And notice they did two things with that. They asked the question, what does the Word say? It says here, they read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning. Now, the word translating means to dissect or to break apart. It was the idea that they took the text of Scripture, they dissected it, kind of like you might dissect a frog in biology class. They dissected that text, and they looked at the words, and they looked at the grammar, and they looked at what it was saying, and they dissected it, and they broke it up, and they answered the question, what is it saying? Now, my translation says they translated it. Why did they need to translate it? Now, remember, this time frame, the people of Israel had been gone for 70 years, and they were living all over the world. And while they maintained Hebrew, they spoke all the languages of the rest of the world. So when they were studying the Hebrew Bible, they needed somebody to help them understand what the Hebrew text was, to break that apart, to dissect it, and tell them what it meant. But not only, or what it said, not only did they need to know what it said, but they needed to know what it meant. It says here they gave the meaning of the text. Well, what do you mean gave the meaning? Well, the word there means to prepare and to organize. It, it meant to put it in a way that they could receive it. Now, when you uh, go home today and uh, dads, you finish your lunch and, uh, you know, your, your wife or your kids or whoever, they, they bring dessert out to you. And uh, they're going to bring out, I don't know, Luther, a banana pudding, all right? How about that? That'd be okay. Would you take that today if that happened? You pick your poison, right? Whatever you want. They're going to they're gonna bring out, uh, bring out a, a cake or a pie or something, and it's going to be glorious, and you're going to love it, and you're going to eat it all, and then you're going to take a nap. And they're going to let you take a nap. I'm trying to help you guys. Y'all ain't getting much today. I'm just saying, all right? 
But, but nobody, what they're not going to do is they're not going to say, well, honey, I want you to, to show you this cake, and, and here's, the, here's the sugar I put in it, and, and here's, the, here's the, I don't even know what goes in a cake. What else is in a cake? Eggs go in that cake, and but here's the what, flour. I don't know. Whatever goes in it, here are all the ingredients. No. When they bring that cake out, it is a finished product. It is prepared. It is set in order in such a way that you're able to eat that cake. Now, teachers... The teachers in the room, uh, we, we've got some folks that need a little more help than others in when you're teaching God's Word from the understanding. There are, there are some folks who are far along. All you got to do, let's say you got a steak, you're going to give them. All you got to do is give them a steak, they can eat it on their own. You got other people where you give them a steak, but you got to get the fork and knife out and you got to cut it for them. Do y'all have some of those in your classroom? You got to cut. There are others that you actually have to chew it up for them and then baby bird it and spit it into their mouth because they're just so. Some of y'all have people in your class like that. Uh, but, but what you have to do as a teacher is you've got to prepare that and give it to them in a way so that they can understand it. And the reason they did that, look at the last, it says, so that they could understand what was read. But the fact of the matter is, they did not show up to this teaching event with some idea in their mind. They showed up with God's word. They put the study in to figure out what it said, and they put the work in to prepare it in such a way that they could massage it into the life of the people. Why? Because they wanted them to understand what was said. This last week, we went to a men's conference, and uh, we drove to North Alabama, and uh, we went up there, and we were in the, in the van for a long time, and one of the guys on the trip had a book, and uh, the book was about the, and I don't even know the right words, so forgive me for not knowing the right words, but, but it was about the Catholic's theology about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and uh, it talks about what they believe about, about her, which is a lot of stuff, and if y'all from cat background, you know what some of those things things are. Like, not just was Jesus born a virgin, but they believe that she was too, uh, and some other things. And so we were looking in that book, and I said, "Man, where where do they come up with this stuff?" And so here's how the Catholics received and got their theology about Mary. Are you ready to hear this? The Pope said, "This is the truth. Y'all need to believe it, or you're out." That's it. No apostle talked about it. It wasn't in the early church. No, the Bible show don't talk about it. The Pope just decided, and it wasn't that long ago, the Pope just decided, hey, I think we should believe this about Mary. This is what we're going to do. And if you don't like it, you can get out to church. Wait a minute. We are supposed to start at God's word. And we determine what we believe based on the word of God. And if somebody brings a gospel contrary to that in God's word, the Bible says, let them be accursed. We do not start with our culture. We do not start with our beliefs. We do not start with what mama said or grandma said. We start with what God said, and we study God's word, and we believe God's word. Contrast that with this passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, encourage with great patience in teaching, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. If First Baptist Lafayette ever gets to that point, God help us. My friends, we are built on God's Word. We are going to teach God's Word. And it is only through the teaching of God's Word that anyone will grow in their faith with Christ. Nothing else will do. Let's turn to the third thing. Look in verse 9. It says, Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. 
They said this for all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink and send portions and have a great celebration, because they had understood the words that were explained to them. You see, the group size produced growth. The group's subject produced growth. And thirdly, the group's submissiveness produced growth. The group's submissiveness produced growth. Uh, When they heard God's word, it says that they were weeping and they were mourning. When you hear God's word, why would you weep and why would you mourn? Why would you be alarmed when you hear God's word? The reason that someone would be alarmed at hearing God's word is because that person saw the perfection of God's word and what it taught about things like sin and judgment. And then they looked at their life and realized, "Uh uh-oh, I have a problem. And they mourned and they grieved over it. They were coming under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God as they were hearing and studying God's Word. Even now, while I'm preaching God's Word, the Spirit of God is moving in your life and in your heart is bringing conviction to you. And they were mourning and they were grieving. And Nehemiah and Ezra said, don't mourn and grieve. The Bible is not intended to hurt you. The Bible is not intended to make you grieve and sorrowful. The Bible is intended to make you joyful. Say, I didn't hear the joy of the Lord is your strength. You need to have joy from studying God's word. Now, let me close with this. This is intended to bring great joy to your life. However, you will have no joy if you don't live it and obey it. Many of you are sour in your spiritual life because you've encountered God's word, but you've not adopted it and obeyed it. And I want to give you an invitation to quit being prideful and arrogant and hard-hearted and say yes to whatever God is saying in your life. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist Lafayette, visit our website at fbclaf.org.